Erev Tov, good evening. Thank you for joining us for the premiere of our Names Not Numbers Holocaust documentary. This project is an incredibly special one, something that we are quite proud of here at Goldock Academy. Our students have worked tirelessly with the support of Ms. Erin Sternthal and Mr. Michael Stern on this project throughout this anything but usual year that we have just been in. In spite of all the challenges, they have persevered and created an absolutely beautiful project. One that takes the stories of these three powerful survivors and retells them for all of us to hear, for all of us to listen to, and for all of us to then tell others about. Because ultimately that is our responsibility to keep these stories alive. And I am quite proud of our students for all that they have done to do their part in this process. So as you watch tonight, be sure to pay attention, be sure to take note of these heroic stories, and most importantly, tell others what you've seen. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you for joining us for the fourth annual Names Not Numbers film premiere. I'm Erin Sternthal, coordinator of the Names Not Numbers Holocaust Documentary Film Project here at Golda Ock Academy. The film you're about to see has been a project like no other during a year like no other. The fact that our school, along with the Names Not Numbers organization, was able to produce this film during a pandemic is nothing short of a miracle. The students in this program were faced with many unknowns, as well as many changes from our project from past years. Despite this, they were willing and eager to capture the stories of the Holocaust. I applaud each of them for their dedication to this project and commitment to preserving the stories of the Holocaust. With a few adjustments and modern medicine, we were fortunate to document the stories of three heroic survivors this year, Norba Bekelis, Judy Buckler, and Luna Kaufman. Each of them defines the meaning of a true survivor and embodies the remarkable resilience of the Jewish people. This project would not have been possible without the guidance and support of our head of school, Mr. Adam Shapiro. Thank you to Mr. Michael Stern, advisor of our Names Not Numbers program, as well as Mr. Alan Chernoff, who taught our students valuable interview skills to prepare them, and Rabbi Stephen Bayer for an insightful and meaningful Imuna session. A special thank you to Elise Shane Brown and Jamie Karras at the Holocaust Council of Greater Metro West for continuing to help match us with survivors for our program. We are extremely grateful to have had our talented filmmaker and editor, Garrett Geary, work with us for the last four years and guide our students with filming techniques. I would also like to thank the founder of Names Not Numbers, Ms. Tova Fish Rosenberg, for her continued guidance and reassurance that we would make this project happen, even during a pandemic. Thank you all once again for joining us to bear witness and supporting our students on their mission to keep the stories of the Holocaust alive. Tell me a fact and I'll learn. Tell me a truth and I'll believe but tell me a story, and it will live in my heart forever. The Names Not Numbers Oral History Film Documentary Project is remembering the stories of the Holocaust and is telling the story of the Holocaust for the world to hear, for the world to learn, and to inspire future generations to combat anti-Semitism and all forms of hatred and intolerance. This unique project is in its 16th year. Over 2,500 survivors and 6,000 students have participated in it worldwide. The students were instructed by teachers and professionals. They learned interviewing techniques from journalists. They learned filming techniques and editing skills from documentary filmmakers. The students interviewed filmed and edited the two hour interviews with each survivor to make 20 minute oral histories that are compiled in the Names Not Numbers documentary at the school. You're about to view the documentary Names Not Numbers, a movie in the making. This film chronicles the students 
is they are being trained by the professionals and includes their reflections. In it is embedded approximately 10 minutes from each interview. This is the student's work. They're filmed and edited interviews. Through this project, our students are preserving history and they are the witnesses to the witnesses. These people that were in the Holocaust are more than just their number that they were assigned. They're actual human beings with actual pasts and actual emotions, and they shouldn't just be described as a number. Everybody was escaping. He's trying to outrun the, uh, the Nazi military coming in because we all knew that uh, with Nazis coming, this, it's not going to be good. There is a lot of people in the world that aren't educated on the subject and that they, they know the general idea of it that these people were oppressed and that they were killed, but they don't truly know the extent and the actual and the seriousness of the situation. The Germans gave us the star, you the, it said on it, and the, for the minute they came we had to put that on. And they had to always be on our now clothes, you did. I have met Holocaust survivors before. This time might be different than meeting Holocaust survivors in the past because it's going to be more of a one-on-one -on -one conversation with um, more of the details. The train started to go. I ran on the platform as long as I could till the end of the platform and that was the, absolutely the last time I saw my parents. Bokir Tov, good morning. It's really nice to be able to be with you guys this morning here in the Bay Knesset and obviously on Zoom as well. As I just said when we walked in, this is by far and away the strangest uh, setup that we have had for this program. We wanted to make sure that we were not giving up the opportunity to lose a year, lose this opportunity to speak to these amazing Holocaust survivors who you will meet throughout this program. The Pasuk from Parashat HaZinu is more timely than ever. Zachor Yemot Olam. Remember the days of old. Sha'al Avicha V'yagedcha. Ask your father and he will tell you. This is the last generation that has the privilege to hear the survivors' testimonies firsthand. You are the direct beneficiaries to hear these firsthand testimonies. You are the last generation that will be able to do this and not just watch it on a screen. And how much more special that you are able to take this experience, capture it, and have it preserved in such a way that others will be able to watch it for many years to come. And to inspire future generations to combat anti Semitism and all forms of hatred and intolerance. Information is power, so that we have the correct information to distribute to people, then their biases will be for something that is true and right instead of something that is wrong and harmful. Elie Wiesel, who we all know, when he was accepting his Nobel Peace Prize in 1986, he said, for us, forgetting was never an option. Remembering is a noble and necessary act. This is your task in this project. But I am confident that you are up for this challenge. And I look forward to seeing what you will produce 
as a final product here. But first, let me just uh, congratulate all of you on being part of the Names Not Numbers program. Um, it's such uh, an important program and it's uh, an opportunity that will not be available to students who are in Goa Elementary right now. One of the things Mr. Chernoff said that I thought was you know, really memorable was letting the silence work for you and let that kind of create uh, an environment where they're more inclined to speak. Think of yourselves as historians, right? You need to gather those facts. You may know the answer to some of the questions you're going to be posing but you want it to come from the survivor, right? You want the survivor's first person perspective on what exactly happened. The thing that the journalist taught us was how to ask these questions with the sensitivity and with the tone that we need to talk to Holocaust survivors, which I think is not only really relevant for Holocaust survivors, but any future interviews we might take part in. The survivor here is really opening up their heart and opening up their wounds for you to, to see and for whomever is going to be seeing the video as well. So you want to have that respect, understanding, and compassion for the survivor. Something that the journalist talked about was what kind of questions not to ask, like not like yes or no questions or ones that could just be one word answers. Listen to the story. Don't just skip over the questions, listen and understand what the survivor is saying. Just as a show of hands, who here has ever used a professional video camera before? Yeah, you guys have, of course. This is all about perspective and it's all about, you know, just how to frame a shot and how to get these cameras to do it properly. What interested me about being a part of Names Not Numbers uh, was uh, mostly at first the filmmaking aspect. Um, I, I really enjoy making films, I enjoy watching them. Whenever you're dealing with a shot, you want to do something called the rule of thirds. Imagine there is a hashtag on the screen. You see how she's looking here? What we call this is lead room. If you give her more lead room, so we put her on the side of the frame, that but looking back at what we learned and how the subject should be a little bit off-centered and have space looking towards what they're, who they're talking to, definitely creates a more natural feel. I'm going to be interviewing Judy Bookler. I'm feeling a little nervous. A little, it feels a little surreal, but I'm excited. I'm going to be interviewing Miss Luna Kaufman. I've never really been in close contact with someone who, who was in the Holocaust. We are the last generation that, were, that will get to talk to these people in person. And so I think that being able to establish a firm sort of connection to the, the people that won't get ground down by time. My grandfather was a Holocaust survivor. Um, he died in 2006 and even though I never really got to have a real conversation with him, um, I want to be able to do this as just for the history of my family also. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming to Goldock Academy to be interviewed for our Names Not Numbers project. Can you please tell me your name? My name is Luna Kaufman. I was born in Kraków, Poland in 1926. My father had a distribution of uh, soap and my mother was an accountant who was running his office. I also had a sister who was a year older than me. I was born in a house that was built by my grandfather on the same parcel of land that the family lived for generations. We were not very much involved in the Jewish community. We lived in a non-Jewish section of town and I went to school 
where there were two, three Jewish kids in the class. Passover Seder was always a very, very big event in our house, and my mother would prefer a beautiful feast. My name is Norbert Bicalis. I was born in Berlin, Germany, January 1929. I had a father and mother, and, uh, and one brother. The brother uh, was eight years older than I. So there was quite a big difference between him and me. And uh, my parents went, were on a market selling fabric for, to, to make clothing. We, we were religious, but my parents had to work. So they, they worked on Saturdays too, unfortunately. We did belong to a synagogue and we, we did go periodically. And certainly for the major holidays, uh, but we hid the talus we had to hide was a giveaway that you were Jewish. My name is Judy Buckler. I was born in Belgrade, Yugoslavia. That time, Yugoslavia, 1928. My father and mother were divorced. I had a lot of friends. Of, uh, they, they were all Jewish girls and we were enjoying each other company and lived like any other girls. We were living at home normally till 1941. And then the Hungarian came because we lived on a, on a border town between Hungary and Yugoslavia. So the Hungary occupied us for three years. In 1938 was a terrible year. The life totally changed for me. And on the 28th of October, in the middle of the night, I hear some noises. During the night, the Nazi police came to our apartment and took away my father and my brother. They were moved on a train and then shipped to Poland. All of Germany erupted into total violence against Jews. Stores were, were, uh, were broken into and looted. Um, that's where the crystal comes from because there was broken glass all over Germany. And our synagogue was set aflame. So I was the only Jewish kid in my class. Well, the principal was sitting with, me, very, with a stiff collar and a, and a bow tie like a like a German official, a very important looking there. He said, Norbert, go home. You can never come back. So why can't I come back? I asked. He says, so he whispered and could barely hear it. Because you're Jewish. Uh, my mother discussed the situation with her sister-in-law and they decided they got to get me at least out of Germany. Now Yugoslavs were not, not anti-Semites, but the Hungarians were even worse than the Germans. We heard a lot, lot of uh, cursing and things like that. Then in the school, they started to have, uh, they called it numerous classes. They didn't let the Jewish kids, all the Jewish kids go to high school or whatever. Hungarian uh, came, then we had no privileges. They made a big uh, a difference between Jewish kids and not Jewish kids. So on the end, the Germans came and that was the worst thing. But the Jewish community found out that some countries, especially England, Great Britain, uh, was taking Jewish children under a certain age, provided they were without their parents. So my mother 
got inscribed me on the uh, to go to leave Germany on a kinder transport. Before that happened, my father was suddenly released from allowed to come back to to Germany on one condition that the whole family get out and they were on a train. The train started to go. I ran on the platform as long as I could till the end of the platform while the train was leaving. And that was the, absolutely the last time I saw my parents. But when the war broke out, we had a neighbor, a non-Jewish neighbor, who worked in a, what do you call the public service, the electric company. And they had a truck that was leaving town, and they offered us seat on the truck to leave the town. And this was something that was totally priceless, because everybody was escaping, is trying to outrun the uh, the Nazi military coming in. I wasn't willing to go. I was the youngest in our family. And they turned around and we stayed and the whole car left. The car only reached the edge of town when a German uh, plane came in and threw a bomb and everybody on the car was killed. So in a sense, I saved the life of, of the city of the family at the time, completely unbeknown to me, obviously. They closed all the banks. And being that we never kept money, at the, any pile of money at home, because the bank was right across the street. So that's where the money was, and that's what we operated. And uh, all of a sudden, we found out that we wound up without any cash to go to store to buy something. Stores were assigned produce according to who they were selling to. And all the Jewish stores had to put Jewish stars on the stores. And we could only shop in the Jewish stores. And at that time, I wasn't old enough to wear yet the armband. I was not going to be 30, up, 13 uh, up till November. And they started with the armbands in, I think, September, right after the war broke out. And I decided that I'm not going to go without an armband. I said, if the whole Jewish community is being uh, marked, I'm going to be wear the armband because I'm Jewish too. And then the Germans came and we were very scared. The Germans gave us the star, you the, it said on it. And the, for the minute they came, we had to put that on. And they had to always be on on our clothes, you did. We had to move to the railroad, near the railroad station, and a few families together in one apartment, like three, four families or more. I don't even remember. and. Uh, and that's how we lived a couple of uh, months. A few days after my parents had left, or maybe two weeks later, I can, my, uh, my turn came to leave. And uh, my kinder transport, my convoy of children, unaccompanied children, went to France. We arrived in Paris. They took us to a house, a small house, uh, but we were 40 kids, plus the adults taking care of us. I didn't know any French. They put me first into two grades below mine and would learn French. All of France started to run away by going south. And so we started to walk. We were totally exhausted. And there was a farm there. 
and we went into a place where the animals were kept, but there were no animals inside. And we soon realized that there were, the place was full of people. It was all French soldiers running away from the Germans. So we decided there was nothing to do but to go back to where we came. When we got there, we had a big surprise. The German army had taken over the house in which we had lived. And we said to each other, not a word of German, because if they hear us speak German, they will know that we're Jews. They decided that they will go on the upper floor and we will be on the lower floor and we won't mix. That lasted a little while. And then the German soldiers who were teenagers, very young, came out and started to play basketball. And we, we played basketball with them. But obviously that couldn't last. And eventually we got permission to, to join the, 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 the other kids in the unoccupied zone of France. They came in to search the train. I had a letter from my parents, obviously written in German, and I was terrified that the Germans would find the letters in German and that would give me away. And I tore them up into small pieces and threw them out the window. It absolutely hurts me to this day that the last messages from my parents, the last letters were destroyed. So when they announced that the ghetto is being formed, we were almost relieved and we all, not that we had any choice anyhow, and we were quite willing to go to the ghetto to, to see where the other family members are, what's happening, and to be together again. We were assigned and we were given half, only half a room for, for us, for the four of us, and they were giving assignment for work. And strangely enough, the woman gave me an assignment to brush factory, which was a blessing because first of all, the brush factory was in the ghetto, so I didn't have to leave the ghetto. And uh, they were paying us. But there was an incident in the brush factory when I was working there, where on high holidays, they said that we have to work, we couldn't rest. But I was working with Hasidic Jews who were running the brush factory and they refused to work and they were praying and when they saw that they are praying, the Nazis walked in to, to, and killed one man. A lot of the people escaped while he was doing that. And I could hear that he was standing behind me and then I heard a little click. So I thought, you know, they always carried silver cigarette cases. So I figured he took a cigarette. I looked at my mother and she was as white as a chalk but didn't say one word. It showed up that he pulled out a gun, put to my head, pulled the trigger. The gun had no bullet because he already used it on this young man and he didn't reload it. And he looked around whether anybody is objecting to it. Since nobody, it appeared to him that nobody cared for me, he decided it wasn't worth reloading the gun and left the room. And that's how I wound up in one piece. And then we went to a Hungarian ghetto and we stayed a few weeks there. And that's where we still have our friends and relatives. And we didn't even say goodbye to each other because on, we thought on the end of the journey we will get together anyway. And we never saw them again. They were sent to Auschwitz and the guest chamber. And the ghetto, it was hard. But it, it was like all people we knew from before and we tried to give courage to each other and said, maybe it won't be so bad. One day they put us in a wagon, like a cattle wagon, and they took like 50, 60 people in their suite there. And for seven days we were sitting in that wagon. 
couldn't get air, we couldn't go to the bathroom, we couldn't get food because we were taken to a labor camp. Thirty-five of us, and from thirty-five, sixteen people went because they were old. They also take, took them to Auschwitz and never heard from them anymore. We, we belong to, a, to an engineer, and he was renting us from, from the German. We, I don't think we ever saw him. We just know the name, Smutschka. That was the, he owned, he was an engineer, and he was making the plans for the dam. Probably paid money, and the Germans made money on us. I arrived in Shaban and, and uh, there were kids, there were about a hundred kids at a time and most of the kids from Berlin that I'd come with were there. So it, it felt much better. I had two wonderful teachers until the same thing happened. They expelled me from school for the crime of being Jewish. The night of the 26th of August 1942 the French police came in the middle of the night and took away many of the boys who were from Germany and, and were uh, 16 years or older. And they died in, in Auschwitz, in, including my, my friend who was like a big brother to me. The Jewish organization Oh, I didn't mention a Jewish organization called OSE, O-S-E, Ervo de, de Secours aux Enfants. They still exist. So the OSE sent me to the Italian zone because the Italians did not persecute the Jews. But OSE had, had an office there. And one of the women, women sort of took charge of me. She sent me to go camping with the Boy Scouts in the Alps. It was absolutely crucial for me, because a short time later, the Italians made an armistice with the Allies, and the Germans came in to occupy the, what was the Italian-occupied zone of France. Since we were not tremendously far from the Swiss border, we decided to go into Switzerland. We stayed in the ghetto and very shortly after they took my father and my sister to work outside of the ghetto. That's the last time I have seen my sister. And the Nazis decided that I had it too good and they sent me to Picric Acid Factory which was uh, making underwater mines, which was extremely toxic. All our bodies turned ye yellow and our hair turned red. I got very sick and they took me to, to a hospital, what they called a hospital. It was just the question that I didn't have to go to work, that I could just stay in bed the whole day. When he saw me coming by, he said, oh my God, I can't believe you are alive because you looked like you're not going to live another day. The Russian army was coming toward Warsaw, and the, co the camp was near Warsaw. And uh, they shipped us out to Germany. I was able to recover. I seemed to have a very strong, you know, constitution, because not that many people survived that thing. We went to, uh, from uh, Puashov ghetto, we went to the uh, concentration camp, the Płaszów concentration camp. We were taken on a death march, and we marched for about two, two weeks or more without food, without place to sleep, without anything. And then at the end, they put us into a barn. And then in the morning, uh, somebody knocked at the door, and it was this uh, supervisor of the farm and he said that the, they put us into the barn and when we opened the door, we saw the pile of the Nazi uniforms in front of it. And he said, look, 
you are 300 women, we don't, I don't have enough food to give you, but if you give me a few women, we stored some potatoes for the winter and we can cook them, which they did. And uh, we were very lucky because of the starved stomach, a lot of people died from uh, uh, eating too much and eating the wrong food. There was no way to go but over the Alps. And it was just an absolutely, absolutely, incredibly difficult. And at one point I just couldn't anymore. I, I told the other two boys, you go on ahead, I can't take another step, I'm, I'm exhausted. And they, they looked at me and said, no, 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 we're, we're exhausted too, and then let's just all rest. We finally found a road. Decide we go down the road, whatever happens, happens. We bump into a, into a, into a patrol, army patrols, but they look just like Germans because the Swiss uniforms were similar to Germans. They fed us, which was great because we hadn't eaten anything. It was one, one of the best meals in my life. <laughs> then they picked us up and sent us to a converted school in Lausanne, uh, the, the school was now home for, for refugees. Actually, it was guarded by the military. It was sort of a, a, a camp for, for, we slept on, on straw on the floor and all of that, but that didn't matter. We were, we were safe. We were safe. You know, the, the war was turning, had turned against the Germans by then. They sent me to Geneva. And Geneva, again, Ose, that same Jewish organization, took over a house and put 40, about 40 kids into that house. And I was one of them. There, they gave us a shower and divided us. They sent us to our, uh, where we will work. We were uh, carrying very hard stones because we were working on a dam. We were carrying the stones, putting on a wagon and, and uh, pushing it or pulling it instead of a horse. And it was very, very hard uh, to carry it, to put, pick it up and put it on the dam and we didn't have much food. And when we complained, they said, you should be quiet because other people are, are dead. And then the, the war started to come to the end and they took us to, um, to the march, dead march, they call it. They wanted to kill us all. And I, I was with my mother and my grandfather. We were walking, even though it was very hard, long, long, long walks and hard uh, trip. But we did it until they ran away one morning. In the evening, we went to sleep. In the morning, they were gone because the war was declared over. And then the war ended and, and we were, ah, oh, we, we survived. We survived. My brother had survived. And now we decided we have to meet. So we met on his birthday for the first time. We hadn't seen each other since 1938. This was 1946. And of course you can imagine that this was a very emotional experience. After the war, I, we were very fortunate. My, my father had a very large family in Belgium, and during the war, they escaped through Cuba to, the, to New York, and uh, they sent a hundred dollars to the bank if, if anybody from my father's family survived. They wouldn't give it to us because my father didn't survive, 
But because of that, they found out that we are alive and where we are living. And from there on, every month, a letter came and $20 was in it. $20 was more than the two of us made for, uh, for a month at the, uh, the factory making the uniforms. My father took me quite a while, maybe about two, three years, till I finally found out a man who, went, who was sent to Auschwitz together with him. And he knew that he was uh, put to crematoria. My sister, I didn't know what happened to her for a number of years after the war. And I was already in Wachang in the 60s when a friend came over and told me that she was with her in the concentration camp when they were at the end of the war, when they put them up on all on ships and they drowned the ships and my sister was drowned. I didn't know anything about it for many, many years. And then, then we went to Budapest and the Russian was in Budapest also. And then we met the Russians who were not much help because they, they wanted to rape us and uh, things like that. But we were careful not to happen. Just they, they made some offers. And, and then we started to run to try to find our way to go back home where we lived. We had a house and there was no house. It was bombed down, so uh, we had to find some place to live. We were homeless. And uh, finally we, we found an apartment and slowly my mother started to work. And I went for a year away uh, to South Serbia in 1949, I went to Israel. What do we do now? He said, well, our parents wanted us to go to America. Let's go to America. I had an uncle in Brooklyn, and he sent me the necessary papers, the so-called affidavit, and he sent me money. And in fact, uh, he sent enough money for me to, to come to America by airplane. I step out and I hear, no bird, no bird, no bird. There was a whole bunch of cousins that I didn't know anything about who were there yelling, no bird, no bird. <laughs> I immediately wanted to, to start school. So I applied to City College. It was a competitive exam, and as you heard, my education was somewhat interrupted. <laughs> and uh, I took the exam and I passed, and I was admitted to City College. Something else happened before I graduated. Uh, several weeks before I graduated, I got married to my wonderful wife, Gerda. So we have two children. We have five grandchildren. My daughter has two children, my son has three. And we have one great-grandchild. One great-grandchild. And as, uh, as you heard, we were married 70 years. We stayed in Poland for five years till I graduated from college. When we were leaving Poland after number of uh, five years after the war. I took my prison dress with me and everybody said, are you crazy? I said, because I will never believe later on in life that this really happened to me. This will be my proof that, that I'm not dreaming. How did you meet your husband? I got very much involved in organizing a student's home in Krakow. And he was coming back from Russia and uh, stopped over in Krakow and decided to go to, the, to school, also to the university, and lived in that house. And that's how we got 
uh, how he got to know each other and he came to Israel and we got married in Israel. I felt a tremendous freedom. I really didn't want to leave Israel. I wanted to join the army and stay, but my husband came and he said, no, I, uh, I moved to America and I want to stay there. You come over. So we moved to West New York and lived in West, West New York till my, my twins were born and then we moved to, to New Brunswick and from New Brunswick in 1960 we moved to Wachong where I still have the house. I met my husband and we got kind of engaged and uh, in 1951 we got married and I had two daughters in Israel. We, li we lived in Natanya for 10 years. My husband always dreamed about going to, coming to America, so I had no choice. We, we went to, it, 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 we came to United States in 1960. I know that you are having and will be having an intense experience in this program. So one of the reasons we're all here today is for you to be able to ask whatever questions, philosophical, theological, pragmatic, any questions you have about what we've been doing. But I want to warn you at the outset, I can give you answers. I cannot give you answers that you'll accept. Or better, I can't really give you answers that you'll like. Why did the Holocaust happen, theologically? What is the definition of free will? True free will means that God's going to let it happen. So why did the, God let the Holocaust happen? Free will means that we're not going to be stopped that if evil things are going to happen, they're going to happen. And the reason, the only way to stop them is if we do, okay? We have three different answers right now. One is, it's free will. One is, we don't really question God. And it's important to recognize that faith is not fact. Faith is not provable. Faith is when you have doubt. You can't have faith unless you doubt. And questioning the Holocaust is the best way of doubting. It is acceptable and it is within our tradition to do. And to a certain extent, I believe it's our responsibility. Reach out your hand to everybody. I work now for a number of years already with Seton Hall University, which is a Catholic university, and there was a nun called uh, Sister Rose Sterling. This is, this is her emblem that was made for her, the cross, uh, uh, you know, intertwined with, uh, with Mark and David. I always cherish that because I feel that my work with Jewish, with Christian community and with the Muslim community produced very, very good results and I'm very happy with it, that they were so receptive and we, we are creating a ring of people that try to live without prejudice. And to me, that's the most important part of life. We do not need to look at the hate, I mean, you need to look, but do not um, concentrate about it. Concentrate on the good things. Then you will really, that's what, how I think you will really make a change. To people who know that like, we, like, my, like my people went through this and that so it never happens again. To combat anti-Semitism, we just keep growing and keep teaching people the truths about our history. Now, that gives me strength to see my little great-grandchildren. 
if I see them on the on the television or in on live, then even my husband who is not well, he even he it gives him a smile on his face. I know what we went through and I hope that my children, grandchildren, great grandchildren I have now and that they don't they won't go through what we went through. If I met my parents today, I would tell them that I've had a marvelous life as, a, as an adult in, this, in America. But the Holocaust started with words. Such irrational hatred must absolutely be avoided and fought by, by decent people. To know this person with in the short time span I think is one of the most interesting things that I learned from his advice and I think and I'm gonna really take that to heart. What we're going through right now is nothing compared to what the people in the Holocaust experience like we still have, we have our freedom, we have the ability to do what we want. There are just a few more restrictions on us, but the people in the Holocaust, they were stripped down to the bare minimum. They didn't have anything for themselves. They were put to the test every single day and it's just not the same. If my survivor were here right now, I would say thank you for giving me this opportunity this is really like a once-in-a-lifetime experience that not that many people get to have. You know, I don't think that anyone is likely to get this kind of experience where you just um, get to speak on such a, an individual level with a Holocaust survivor um, if they're not, if you don't have a relative, um, especially if you don't have a relative like I do, do this program. Um, not just because you'll get to speak to a Holocaust survivor, but because you'll get to, to take on that responsibility of, of passing down the stories and the memory of the Holocaust um, to the next generation. Mm -hmm.